بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله بخير ما حمده الحامدون الحمد لله حمد الذاكرين الشاكرين وسبحان الله العلي العظيم والله أكبر الله أكبر على كل من طغى وتجبر والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد حبيب رب العالمين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين وعلى من اتبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم يا رب يا رب يا سابغ النعم يا فارج الغمم يا كاشف الظلم اللهم يا رب يا أعدل من حكم ويا حسيب من ظلم يا أول بلا بداية ويا آخر بلا نهاية اجعل للمسلمين واجعل لأمتنا فرجا ومخرجا يا علي عظيم ونصلي ونسلم ونبارك على الحبيب المصطفى خاتم النبيين رمضان is already midway through subhanallah it arrives and with such amazing speed it passes And as I mentioned before, you can count your life in terms of how many Ramadans you went through. Each Ramadan is an opportunity to pause, to reflect upon your life, to reflect upon your relationship with Allah, to reflect upon your relationship with Islam, and to reflect upon where you are in the world. As Allah reminds us that each of us is under the gazeful watch of Allah and the angels, the kiram and katibin. Those who keep track of everything we do and document it. Allah reminds us whether the writing is a writing like what we do in human, in human life, whether the angels document everything in writing in the sense that we write and document in human life or in some other completely different metaphysical sense. But what matters is the creation of a record, the creation of a testimony, shahada, and that the time will come when that record, when you are confronted by that record and by that testimony. Everything that you say, everything that you do, 
you will be confronted with. That is an article of faith. But all matters of faith is something that you have to feel in your heart. There are those who pass through Ramadan, many of us pass through Ramadan, and they never get a sense of who is observing them and who is recording their deeds. We know Allah tells us, عَلَيْكُمْ كِرَامًا كَاتِبِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ مَا تَفْعَلُونَ That for each one of us, there are observers. And these observers record what we do. And they see what we do. And they record it not to preserve memory, but for our benefit as evidentially proof to be presented to, for us to be confronted with in the final judgment. Again, so many people in life, even believing good Muslims, even more practicing Muslims can go through life and never get a sense of the presence of the observers. The presence of the observers is like a ghostly presence. If you ever had a paranormal experience, paranormal experience is something that is beyond the laws of physics, beyond the laws of the norm. It's, a, it's something that the hairs on your skin feel before your rational senses perceive. The nature of a paranormal experience is that the hairs on your skin stand up even before your eyes or ears see or hear anything. Feeling the kiraman katibin, feeling the presence of those who record the deeds, especially when you are alone, is something that you feel in the heart, that the hair on your skin feels. The opportunity, I won't say to meet your observers because you don't meet them, but the opportunity to get a sense of the reality of the presence that records your deeds is greatly heightened in Ramadan. It is as if and I have no proof for, for that, but it is just a speculation. It is as if what separates you from consciousness of the observers wears thin during the month of Ramadan. If you spend time in zikr and prayer, if you stay up at night 
and you pray and not even, you don't even have to do it for hours, but just do it for a concentrated period of time, especially before Fajr, you get a sense of the observers. You get a sense of those who record your deeds. And then your awareness of your life on this earth and what it means is greatly impacted. I mention this because I am always fascinated by examples of believers whose faith awareness of Allah and Allah's message drove them to accomplish remarkable feats to set examples that continue to be inspiring through history. Last Juma we talked about the example of Bilal, the former slave, who in order to help a stranger in need, was willing, was willing to put himself at risk of becoming enslaved again. And last Juma, we asked the question, what type of faith drove a Sahabi like Bilal? This Juma, I want to tell you the story of another man that has always fascinated me. This fellow has a kunya. Of course, his name is rather long, but his kunya is Abu Basir. A fascinating personality by all measures. Abu Basir was not from the prestigious tribes of Mecca. He was not from the tribe of Quraysh. In fact, some reports say that Abu Basir lived in Mecca as a slave. Some reports say that he was a former slave, but all reports agree that Abu Basir was a poor man and not from any of the prestigious tribes of Mecca. And as a, as a man of little, little means and a disempowered man, the practice of Meccans at the time was that if you are poor and powerless, you find a powerful tribe to offer its protection to you. Now often, of course, in order to offer their protection to you, they acted like good capitalists. They would abuse you for it. Anyway, Abu Basir was legally under the protection of one such tribe. Some reports say it was the Abu Zuhra tribe. But what matters for us is that when Abu Basir listens to the Qur'an, 
hears the Quran, his heart and soul is moved and he converts to Islam. When he converted to Islam, the tribe that was supposed to offer him protection promptly arrested him, imprisoned him, and started torturing him to force him to leave the Islamic faith. He was starved, denied water, imprisoned, beaten, whipped, and so on. As the persecution of Muslims in large grew in Mecca, and finally the Prophet ﷺ decided to migrate from Mecca to Medina in order to escape persecution. This worked for the majority of converts in Mecca. But there was a group of Muslims who could not migrate to Medina with the Prophet ﷺ because they were persecuted by Meccans and the Meccans would not let them go. So there was a group of people who had converted to Islam that could not join the Prophet ﷺ in his migration from Mecca to Medina. And after the Prophet migrated to Medina, they remained stuck in Mecca, persecuted and abused. Now you can imagine, you know that the Prophet that you dream of following is now in a different city, and you are under the hands of your persecutors, your biggest dream is to join your fellow Muslims in Medina, but you can't. Not surprising, because of the persecution, some Muslims succumbed, some Muslims were killed, but some Muslims succumbed and left Islam, but there remained a core that stubbornly refused to leave Islam regardless of the persecution and the suffering. Eventually, the Prophet ﷺ enters into a treaty with Mecca, with Quraysh, called Sulh al hudaybiyah and according to the terms of this treaty, which was a ceasefire treaty, a treaty of non-hostility, by the terms of the treaty, the Prophet was not allowed to take in anyone that escapes from Mecca or that converts to Islam from Mecca. So the treaty between Medina and Mecca said, you Muslims, if anyone from, from the date of this treaty onwards, from the time we signed this treaty, if anyone comes to you from Mecca having converted to Islam, you can't take them in. Of course, the, the terms of this treaty was con very controversial at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions, but that's another story. Abu Basir, after being long persecuted, eventually he is able to escape his persecutors. 
in one day something happens where he is able to slip out. And of course, because Abu Basir was able to slip out, he rushed traveling the deserts night and day to go to Medina to join the Prophet ﷺ. To him, that was the moment of liberation that he has dreamt of after years of torment. The problem is that the Kuffar discovered that Abu Basir had slipped away and is running, is making a run to Medina. So the Kuffar had two men get on their camels or horses, I don't remember, and pursue Abu Basir across the desert. They realize that Abu Basir is heading to Medina and they follow him to Medina. Abu Basir arrives in Medina and of course it's a moment of ultimate liberation. Instead of living in a prison cell where he's tormented every day, now he is in a city with his fellow Muslims everywhere saying assalamu alaikum, smiling in his face. No sooner when Abu Basir enters in the presence of the Prophet والسلام, to get his blessings to now live in Medina the two representatives from Mecca that were pursuing him in the desert arrive. And when they arrive, they tell the Prophet, you have to return Abu Basir to us. Why? Because of the terms of the peace treaty. Abu Basir, of course, was very upset and argued that he cannot be returned to the Meccans because they will torture him. In a truly difficult moment, the Prophet ﷺ tells Abu Basir, إِنَّ هَؤُلَاءِ قَوْمْ صَالَحُونَ وَإِنَّ لَا نَغْدُرْ فَالْحَقْ بِقَوْمِ basically tell them, unfortunately, we have a peace agreement with these people. We Muslims do not cheat and we do not betray our agreements. And so there's no way I can grant you asylum or protection. This, of course, was extremely upsetting to Abu Basir. He's being handed over to his persecutors. And in fact, the, these two Qurayshis take Abu Basir and they start heading back to Mecca. On the way back to Mecca, one of the men goes to the bathroom in the desert, of course. And while that one of the men is doing his business, Abu Basir tricks the other man, manages to get a hold of his sword and kills his captor. When the second man comes after having gone to, to the toilet and sees Abu Basir holding the sword and the sword has blood on it, that man, who is Abu Basir's captor, himself runs with Abu Basir after him. 
the irony is where does the Meccan run to? Well, he was close to Medina, so he runs back to Medina with Abu Basir in pursuit. And as soon as he goes to Medina, he enters the Prophet's mosque and yells at the Prophet, protect me, protect me, this man is going to kill me. The Prophet, in fact, protects him. And Abu Basir says to the Prophet, sort of in, in like thinking like a lawyer for a second, Okay, listen, you fulfilled the terms of the agreement with me. I came to you, you turned me away. Now that you turned me away, I happen to escape my captors. You fulfilled your ends of the bargain. Now let me stay. Please let me live in Medina. The Prophet said, we can't. The terms of the agreement is that we cannot accept any of the converts of Mecca after the date of the treaty. Abu Basir says a famous statement. It says, Ya Rasulullah, taruddani للمشركين يفتنونني في ديني. Do you send me back to these Meccans so that they can persecute me because of my religion? The Prophet ﷺ responds to Abu Basir with these following, with the following words that I want you to reflect upon. اصبر واحتسب اصبر واحتسب فإن الله يجعل لك فرج ومخرج Be patient Persevere on the path And pray to Allah to present you with a way out. Only Allah can present true miracles that would solve problems in ways that you've never expected. So at this point, Abu Basir twice went to Medina. Once when he escaped Mecca, second time when he escaped his captors, and both times the Prophet ﷺ said, I can't accept you because we have a peace agreement. We have a contract. And we have to, we cannot cheat. We Muslims don't cheat, we don't lie, we don't betray. But at this point, if Abu Basir was a modern Muslim who has been persecuted for years, manages to get away and is disappointed when he resorts to his fellow Muslims, he is turned down and disappointed. I often wondered how many in Abu Basir's position, especially among modern Muslims, would become jaded and soured and would lose faith in fellow Muslims, in not in Islam itself, and would say, my suffering and my pain and my hurt and my sacrifices are not appreciated, why should I care? Why should I bother? After years of persecution, I managed to get away twice. And I'm turned away twice? Just because I'm poor? Just because I do not come 
Just because I do not come from a prominent family and a prominent tribe, so many of today's Muslims would have said, the heck was this. Muslims are losers. I don't care. But what Abu Basir did when he was turned away for the second time, he said, okay, fine, you've turned me away. But I'm not going to go back to Mecca. Instead, Abu Basir in, went and lived by himself in an area called al Is. al Is is on the way between Mecca and Damascus. And he vowed to make the people who persecuted him pay. He didn't become bitter and jaded towards Muslims. He focused on those who persecuted him, on those who are the real enemy. And he, in fact, persevered following the words of the Prophet. Be patient and persevere, for Allah will make a way out for you. What Abu Basir did, he said, fine. You Meccans, if I'm with you, you torture me. You won't allow me to resort to Medina, to live in peace with my fellow Muslims. Then I am going to set camp al Ais. And I am going to attack your trade caravans going from Mecca to Damascus and Damascus to Mecca. I'm going to make, I'm going to affect you in your pockets. I'm going to make my existence costly to you. I'm going to wage an economic warfare against you. Initially, Abu Basir is an al alone. But eventually the word gets around. More and more people, persecuted people, hear about Abu Is and his harassment of the Meccan caravans. So more and more disempowered and persecuted people who escape from Mecca or other areas who cannot join the Prophet in Medina because of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, go and live with Abu Basir in al Ais until a community of about 60 or 70 people formed. 60 and 70 people with some women and some children. Many of them, by the way, were forced to escape leaving their, their children, their family, behind. So some of them, like Abu Basir himself, didn't have his wife and children with him. But that group of Muslims in al Ais, the 60 of 70 people, became the living nightmare, a living nightmare for Mecca. Because now, someone like Abu Jandal, Abu Jandal ibn Suhail, who was an, you know, a, a mythical warrior, just had abilities with the sword and spear that were, eventually escapes persecution in Mecca as well, and also joins Abu Basir in this area of al Ais, and they become Mecca's living nightmare. As Mecca tries to do business, make money, these former, these people who were persecuted and who escaped and who cannot live in Mecca and Medina, but will not, of course, go back to persecute, being persecuted in Mecca, are harassing Meccan business and costing Mecca a lot of money. So eventually, what does Mecca do? It goes to the Prophet Muhammad and says, please, Take these people in. Prophet Muhammad 
Rasulullah says, but how about the peace treaty? You told me I can't take any people in. He said, no, 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 no. We forgive this provision. Please, please, please take them in. They are a pain in our backs. Please just take them into the Medina. The Prophet ﷺ is very happy and he says, okay, fine, I will write them to come join us in Medina. So he writes a letter to Abu Jandal, who at the time was their chief. And Abu Jandal has received the letter of the Prophet to now leave al and come live with fellow Muslims in Medina. And Abu Jandal reads the Prophet's letter to Abu uh, Abu Basir, who started it, started this whole thing. The sad thing, though, is that Abu Basir receives the letter when he is on his deathbed. So the last thing he hears before he leaves this world is the letter of the Prophet ﷺ saying, come join us in Medina. He hears the letter and he passes away and he's buried in al till this very day. Abu Jandal buries him and his fellow Muslims pray over him and he is buried in al They leave the body there and all the other Muslims, the rest of the Muslims, travel to Medina where they live for until they left this world. Look at the example of these, the, the conviction, the iman of this, these early Muslims. Man who is disempowered and dispossessed to the point that he is unable to throw the shackles off his back and migrate with his fellow Muslims from Mecca and Medina. He sees fellow Muslims migrate to Medina, and not only that, but fight battles and win them. And he is trapped in Mecca in a prison cell being tortured. And he doesn't grow bitter against God. He doesn't grow bitter. He doesn't say, why God? Why me? Why did he put me, create me in a family that is so poor? Why can't my fellow Muslims pay my, give Mecca enough money to buy my freedom? Doesn't impeach his iman. But even when he escapes and is turned away and is able to elude his captors and, and again go back to Medina and is again turned away, It doesn't become a story about self-pity and dwelling in self-loathing. He doesn't become in need of counseling and a psychologist or a psychiatrist and antidepressant pills. Doesn't look for alcohol or drugs to fill in the emotional shock, the deep disappointments of life, the great letdowns. He says, I will settle in a place alone, as a lone Muslim, doing what my prayer and my ibadah tells me to do. And in that case, his ibadah led him to the idea of an economic warfare. Instead of complaining and bitching, he led an economic warfare. And because he was so dedicated, more and more persecuted people joined him. There are winning personalities. 
there are personalities that don't know self-pity and do not think about the ways that life has wronged them before they think about what they owe God. It's an orientation. Do you focus about what life owes you And is that your focus? Or is your focus on what you owe God? Is your focus about all the ways that other human beings disappointed you? Or are you focused on the ways that you could disappoint God? It's a basic fundamental orientation. If your focus is on the ways that human beings have disappointed you, then you have no space to think about the truth, and that is the way that you disappoint yourself, and that you disappoint God. Often people ask me, why was Islam revealed in that area of the world? Why that area of the world? Why that place? And I tell you, the answer is very simple. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that personalities like Abu Basir and like Bilal, leave alone like Omar and Abu Bakr and Ali, were there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that these are winning personalities that can change the face of the earth. And so that is where Allah gave his, Allah's most important treasured trust, Allah's religion. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الله أكبر العلي العظيم والصلاة والسلام على محمد النبي الأمين وخاتم الأنبياء أجمعين المرسل رحمة للعالمين والصلاة والسلام على آله وأصحابه ومن تبعوا من ومن ومن تبعوا بإحسان إلى يوم الدين The affairs of this world demands a strong Muslim. Recently I was reading an article about suicides among Muslim youth. And I know that a percentage of these suicides is an illness. And that's a separate question. But there is a percentage that comes because we do not inspire our youth. Because they find their parents constantly in a mode of victimhood. and constantly in a mode of talking about the way, and and this is common, especially among immigrants, the way that life has wronged them. You are either, you either take hold of the affairs in this world with a trust and belief in Allah where you become a mujahid, a person waging waging jihad against injustice or you become a theoretical Muslim, an abstract Muslim a Muslim who 
pontificates a lot, but carries none of the spirit, none of the pioneering spirit of Islam. Consider with me the number of issues that just pass by us all the time. One of the things that for me as a Muslim is absolutely shocking. There are well over 70,000 Americans that died of Corona. Although well over 70,000 Americans died of the coronavirus, and there is well over a thousand new infections every day, we keep hearing all the time from the federal government and state governments about reactivating the economy, about reopening businesses, about people going back to work. The part that people will not talk about is that the reason people are so pressured to go back to work is because the federal government and the state governments are not taking care of their economic needs if you have to wait months to receive a stimulus check for a thousand dollars or whatever, which is nothing, then obviously, yes, the economic pressure makes you, although nothing has changed, although well over a thousand people die every day, and about 20 to 30 thousand people are infected with the coronavirus, Yet you, in order to provide for your family, you are willing to go back to work and put yourself at an enormous amount of risk. Consider with me the fact that in 9-11 when 3,000 Americans died from a terrorist attack, the U.S. was willing to invade two countries kill millions of people and spend the billions of dollars that the U.S. spent fighting a war that it is continuous fighting to this day that preoccupied us for over a decade. And the justification for this is 9-11, these people killed 3,000 Americans. Now, in the war on Corona, which has killed 78,000 plus Americans, compare the billions of dollars that we are willing to spend to fight Corona and provide for American citizens and protect American citizens to the money we spent invading the world, committing a genocide in Iraq, a massacre in Afghanistan, compare the billions we spent on war to address the murder of 3,000 Americans compared to the billions that we have spent or willing to spend fighting the war against coronavirus, which has murdered many times as May as, as September, 11, murder, September 11 murdered. These ethical, moral issues must present themselves to us. Rich people can afford to send people to work as they sit in their mansions, protected, well guarded. But the blunt, honest truth is that the people demonstrating in the streets because they want to go back to work are the people who can't pay their bills. Yeah, okay, so the governor of the state says, well, you you, you can't be evicted till January, or the, the, the utilities cannot be shut off till January. Okay, fine, but you still owe this money. After January, you still have to pay the back rent that you owe. How are you going to pay it? 
you still owe the utility bills that accumulated that you weren't able to pay. Now, in a just system, the government would come and say, 78,000 Americans is something we cannot afford. Because you citizens are very important to us. And in a just system, the government would not be a hypocrite if allegedly Muslims murder 3,000 Americans in 9-11. We are willing to invade the world, spend billions of dollars on weapons. The Congress gives the federal government a carte blanche to do whatever it wants. But when those dying are the poor and the powerless, the wrong races, as is in the case of coronavirus, because it's disproportionately blacks and Hispanics and people who don't have money are the ones who are dying from corona. It's the people who drive cabs, who work in grocery stores, who work in the, in, in the, 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 the jobs that require interaction with human beings. The wealthy are protected. Why is it that even under these circumstances, we will still spend billions of dollars on exploring Mars and building crazily advanced weapon systems? These black budget items where even a good U.S. citizen doesn't know how much is being spent. But we will count nickels and dimes when it comes to protecting our own citizens from a deadly disease. When you are forced to go back to work, because many of us will be forced to go back to work, because things are opening up, and you catch corona and die, you will just be a statistic. I'll tell you one thing. If Abu Basir was alive today, and he, if he was an American, I assure you Abu Basir would have led a huge lobby to force the federal government and state governments to confront the inequity and racism of the system in which we live in. If Bilal was alive, he wouldn't bitch and complain about how Muslims are losers. They would be at the forefront of the battle to make Muslims winners. Before I close, I must mention something because, partly because of the morality of it, and partly because I'm a law professor and have taken an oath as a member of U.S. bars, legal bars. You take an oath about this legal system. I'm sure all of you or most of you heard of the murder of Ahmed Arbery, who as far as I know, by the way, is not a Muslim and it's not an issue of whether he's a Muslim or not. But this is a black man in Georgia who was jogging, two white men, the type of white men who look like Trump supporters, the type of white men who you know you wouldn't want to have an encounter with as a Muslim or as a dark-skinned person. They're armed. One of them is a former deputy. And they shoot him and kill him. This was back in February. And they're not charged 
until someone leaks a video of the incident, a very painful video. In which, basically, they, these people claimed that there, there was a robbery, there was a trespass. They, they had caught someone, someone trespassing on the property of a neighbor. And so they saw this black man running. They claimed that they said, well, this is the man that was on the video trespassing on our property or stealing something from a property. Apparently, a gun was stolen from a neighbor's property or a friend's property or something like that. And they say, oh, they, this looks like him. So they track him, they go after him, and they end up killing him. They're not charged until a video is leaked of the incident. And after a video is leaked of the incident, they are arrested and charged yesterday. Now, they might still get off because in a jury, you never know what a jury going to, is going to do. And that's just the way it is. But the question for me, the reason these two were charged in the murder of this unarmed black man is because a video was leaked, and when the video was leaked, there was an outrage. And because there was an outrage, several months after the incident, these two are arrested and charged. And as I said, that, that doesn't guarantee a conviction. What if there was no video? What if it was just two white men and a dead black man and a story said by the killers without any evidence? I'll tell you what would happen. Like what happens all over this country every day of every week, of every month, of every year. A lynching and these people get away the same people who murdered this black man are the type of people who are staunch Islamophobes the same people who murdered this black man are the same people who would love to kill Muslims so it's just a matter of whether they find you or they find the black man. Injustice has the same ugly face. And it is Muslims who should be at the forefront of the war against this ugliness and this injustice. Muslims. What would an Abu Basir say? What would Bilal say? What would the Prophet Muhammad say? I can't help when I think, when I read about an incident like this and make the mistake of watching that, I don't know how many seconds video that you can find on the net of the killing. I remember the Muslims who are very popular, who talk about there is no racial problem. These white Muslims who say there is no racial problems. Oh, the cops kill as many whites as they kill blacks, but it's just we don't pay attention to, to the cops when they kill whites. These Uncle Tom Muslims who have nothing in common with an Abu Basir or a Bilal because they were born in privilege, converted in privilege, remained in privilege, and will die in privilege. They will never know anything about the revolutionary message of Islam, the message of social justice and social equity. اللهم اعف عنا اللهم اغفر لنا اللهم ارحمنا يا علي عظيم اللهم تب علينا يا تواب يا كريم اللهم forgive our sins
grant us your light, your love, and your forgiveness. Grant us the guidance so that we can uphold justice and become better Muslims. يا علي يا عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القرب والإحسان والمنكر والبغي فاسكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة